thank you particularly to the BMJ for giving me the opportunity to come and say <clears throat> a few words. It's one of those titles that's great when you first accept the talk, and then when you start to think a bit more about it, you begin to wonder really which angle to come at it from. So I've decided to take a fairly high-level view of this, and um, I will end up trying to, uh, to paint a picture of whether I think healthcare is affordable or not. But my starting position is that as it stands at the moment, it is not affordable, with the exception perhaps of some parts of the Asian Pacific economic community. When I look at the future of healthcare, it seems to me that it's gonna be driven by four forces, really. The first is economics. The second is a set of expectations, predominantly public expectations. The third is technology, and the fourth is demographics. And I put them in that order. Because although most people put demographics first, actually if you had enough money you wouldn't worry about the demographics, you just deal with the problem. Now 50% of the world's economies are in the, in the grip of a debt workout at the, at the moment, with the exception of those that I've just mentioned. An increased private debt for individuals means that people save more and they spend less. And that's not good for rejuvenating economies. For governments, particularly our government, it means greater increased expenditure on bailing out organizations. It means that corporates tighten their belt and it means that less money is coming in through tax revenue into the exchequer. Not a good mix. For healthcare, it means that there is increased unemployment, which in turn brings a, a, a series of reasons for increased demand on healthcare. Now last year, last August, the UK national net financial liabilities were 823 billion pounds, or 56% of our gross domestic product, if you measure it in a transactional way. The interest payments on that alone were 30 billion pounds a year. So for each of you that comes from England, that's about a thousand pounds a year you're just using to pay interest on the national debt. What that means for people like me in the health service is that amount of money is enough to pay for frontline staff in the NHS for a year, to pay for the community drugs bill three times over, or to pay for outpatient appointments and the associated procedures four times over. Next year, the... Um, the financial liabilities increase from 56% of gross domestic product to 67%. And over the next five years, unless we do something differently, the interest payments on our national debt will rise to 70 billion pounds. That's more than double of what we're paying at the moment. So we have to do something about this. Now, how you tackle this kind of, of massive economic problem is really a matter of, of economic philosophy. You can retain public expenditure while industry recovers, or you can cut public spending to create space to catalyze commercial innovation. And different countries have taken a different view. But it's quite clear that our country has taken the view that cutting public expenditure is the way forward. So what does that mean for us in terms of health care in, in England? We know that um, demand is continuing to increase on the NHS. We also know that even after special pleading, the amount of money that's available for the NHS for the foreseeable future is going to rise very slowly. Compared with in the past, an average rise of somewhere between four and 6% a year, and more recently closer to 10% a year. So we've suddenly gone from a time of plenty, really, to a time of austerity. And the difference between the amount of available money and the increasing demand opens up a virtual gap, which is equivalent to about 20 billion pounds a year. And on a, on a NHS budget of somewhere around about 100 billion pounds a year, that's quite a substantial amount. Now, this isn't peculiar to the UK this sort of financial threat to healthcare services, but I am gonna focus on, um, on England in particular. And then we have a set of expectations in healthcare, which will be the second driver. And in my view, there are three broad sets of expectations. The first of those are public expectations. The public expect a high standard of healthcare for all, and that's not an unreasonable expectation. 
And in the UK, they expect that to be tax-funded and free at the point of delivery. Another expectation that the public have is that on the whole, most services will be relatively close to home. Providers of healthcare have a different set of expectations. They want a reasonable rate of remuneration so that they can pay their staff well and develop their services. And corporates want a fair return on their investment, particularly to cover R&D costs. And governments, who are broadly responsible for overseeing healthcare systems, want value for money. You can see that all of these are on a collision course with a new economic reality. And therein lies our dilemma. Government revenues in this country have been rising in line with a seemingly pros prosperous economy for a, a, a long time. The public have come to expect a high standard of care, staff, good terms of employment, and corporates a decent margin. And those expectations have been forged over 30 years of prosperity in a relatively benign economic environment during a time of plenty, a time of abundance. But expectations that are forged in that environment turn into a set of rights, a set of entitlements in terms of austerity. We've seen that, for example, with some of the um, uh, demonstrations around education. Now, I think this economic reality is going to lead to a significant set of clash of expectations which will be difficult to deal with, both professionally and politically. And in terms of technology, which is the third driver for change, science is very, will advance inexorably and will continue to have major impact on the nature of the care that we deliver. But my interest lies mainly in information technology because I think that's going to be the really big driver over the next few years. We now live in the world of the iPad 2, interactive TV, things that people didn't dream of um, only a decade ago. People have become their own bankers, their own travel agents, their own checkout cashiers at supermarkets. And this IT, this availability of knowledge, will change the, uh, the behavioral and social dimensions of medical practice in a way that will never, ever go back. IT will shrink the world. Ultimately, I believe that patients will own their own electronic records and that that means that continuity of care will change from the healthcare professional to the patient themselves. Online consultations will become the norm. It'll break down geographical boundaries, both within countries and at an international level. It will bring 24-7 access, which will change the economic considerations and issues of regulation over quality for all healthcare systems. So about a month ago, I was in New Zealand, and I bump into a guy who says, I report x-rays for two major teaching hospitals in this country. What does that mean in the future as that sort of practice becomes more widespread, him reporting x-rays daylight in New Zealand while it's dark here? What does that mean for the way we handle quality? And what does it mean for the, uh, for the economics of healthcare? These are issues I think that we have to grapple with. But any, in any event, what it means is that in relatively short order, in my view, healthcare will become a knowledge transfer industry rather than simply a delivery industry. And this will play directly into the economics of healthcare. Parallel worlds will converge. The shrinkage will raise a series of economic questions. What the average citizen in China expects to do for and buy with one US dollar is very different to what the average US citizen believes he needs to do to earn a dollar and what he expects to get for it when he spends it. So we're going to have to start asking, as, as this kind of shrinkage happens, what we can learn from low-income countries such as India and China about, uh, about health care. You know, Mao's legacy was one of low expectations for people in China. In the West, the economic growth has led to very high expectations. And the future, I believe, will bring convergence of knowledge through an increasingly connected world. And no sector, no healthcare sector will be an island in this connected world. It goes back to a comment that Warren Buffett made 
which was that you can't have hot water at one end of the bath and cold water at the other end for very long because soon they mix. So people are gonna ask why artificial hips, cataracts, artificial limbs cost an order of magnitude less in the East than in the West. And that is gonna play into economic regulation, quality regulation, and cost considerations as healthcare uh, advances. And the high income countries in my view, are at risk of becoming prisoners of their own expectations. And this is going to create a difficult political debate. But we've started to have that um, debate in this country. We are a big system. Um, our healthcare service in England covers about 60 million patients, sees about a million patients a day. It's got about 1.4 million staff working for it. It covers everything from acute care to, uh, to mental health, to opticians and dentistry. And it became clear to us about two years ago that we needed to really grapple with the, with the economic issues and we need to, to free up this 20 billion pounds worth of, uh, of expenditure for reinvestment in the service for spending in different ways. These are not cuts, these are simply freeing up money to spend in a different way in the health service. Now we believe that we can get about 40% of that money from national action, which is around pay restriction and reduction of running costs and taking 40% of management costs out of the NHS. We believe we can get another 40% from operational efficiency. That means through procurement and shared back office functions and also sweating the assets of provider organizations by reducing the tariff that we pay for different procedures and increasing throughput. But really importantly, we believe that 20% of that can come from delivering service change, from shifting services out of the acute sector where we spend 50% of our money into the community, by preventing avoidable admissions, whether those be first time or readmissions, and by reducing the pinball effect that we are all familiar with, with people going to and from organizations. So in the city where I live, which is Birmingham, you can go into one hospital with a breast lump and you can have one or two appointments and emerge very soon afterwards with a histological diagnosis and a care plan for surgery. You can go into another one where they say, have your mammogram today, come back for your biopsy tomorrow, come back in three days time for your histology, come back in a week's time to see the surgeon. Now, that latter um, scenario is neither efficient, effective, and most importantly, it's not compassionate. We could save a lot of money by simply making it compassionate. So I believe that there's a lot we can do in our health service that can be led by clinicians to improve service, to improve quality, and to save money. Now, all Western countries uh, are struggling with healthcare funding. In this country, the NHS is owned by the people who are shareholders of the NHS. Most of us in this room are shareholders. Occasionally we become reluctant, frightened, or distressed customers. But it's not quite the same as going to QuickFit to have your exhaust refitted. What we need to acknowledge, though, is that we are a service industry and that we need to respond to the, to the demands of society, and quite frankly, to the demands of our customers, who we call patients. I'm not an economist, but when I look at successful companies and ask myself, what, what characteristics do I see in them that's helped them to survive in difficult economic times, it seems to me that they do three things. The first is, they make sure they understand the finances of their organization and they tight, take a, a tight grip on their finances. The second thing is they ask their customers what they want. And the third thing is they innovate to provide their customers what they want. I just invite you to reflect for a second on how well different healthcare systems around the world engage in the latter two endeavors. But most importantly, the successful companies do that with urgency because if they don't, they're out of business. And that brings me then to the issue of innovation in healthcare. Innovation, in my view, is not just about 
robots and nanotechnology. It's about the overuse and the underuse of treatments. It's about the application of new technologies. And we're good at using new technologies to improve quality or to improve experience. What we're not good at in healthcare is using new technologies to reduce cost. And actually, that's one of the fundamental drivers for new technology in other industries. I also find myself asking something about the mindset on costs. Um, in my current position and in previous positions, um, I'm inundated with people saying, we can make the service better, just give us anything ranging from 50 pounds to several million. And I find myself thinking those very same people will go down at the weekend to PC World and want to buy a new computer. And they will expect that computer to be of higher specifications and less cost, or at least no more cost, than the computer they bought two or three years ago. And yet in healthcare, somehow or other, we seem to think it's different, that to improve quality costs more. And it doesn't. A friend of mine, Jeff Rich, who's also a cardiac surgeon, went on to become uh, director of Medicare for a while, um, looked at heart surgery units in Virginia. And in Virginia, all the heart surgery units perform better than the national average in terms of mortality. So what he did was he risk stratified all the results according to the, the patient profiles and looked at results and then looked at cost. And the difference between the hospital at one end and a hospital at the other end in terms of performance the difference was $30,000 versus $20,000. So 30% difference in cost for coronary artery bypass surgery. With the better hospitals costing 30% less. And that makes intuitive sense, doesn't it? If you operate on the right people at the right time, do a decent operation, you have fewer complications and people get home sooner. So Based on that, we've asked NICE to collate through NHS evidence as much information as they can from around the NHS and around the world of examples where improved quality of care can demonstrably cost less. And I would invite you to visit um, the NHS evidence website because there's quite a lot of interesting stuff there. But all of this requires quite a lot of relentless change if we are going to make healthcare affordable for the future. And it seems to me that there are two different types of change we can make. There's the incremental change, which is some evidence is accrued, it's published in a journal, people see it on coffee tables or in operating theater rooms or in clinics, and over the course of 15 years, some kind of change happens, because that's how long it takes, even after class one evidence is available, for things to be picked up by a, a healthcare system. We don't have 15 years. We need to think of ways of concertinering that. The other way that change happens is by very focused um, policy and leadership combined with incentives. And the two examples which spring to mind for me in the health service are in the 1970s, when we had these massive psychiatric asylums full of people, some of them with 5,000 beds. And in relatively short order, those were closed. They were replaced by much more effective, smaller hospitals supporting community-based services. Better quality care, nicer for the patients, and certainly much cheaper for the service, but the right direction of travel. The second area where we had a major impact in terms of step change was the focus that was brought to day case surgery in the National Health Service. So we have quite a lot to think about, given the current economic environment, about where we should be focusing on making big step changes on the one hand, and how we accelerate change and concertina that 15-year uptake. And the Prime Minister has asked the Chief Executive of the NHS to produce a report on, um, on how we can improve innovation and uptake in the NHS. That report is due out at the, uh, at the end of November and is currently being collated by Sir Ian Carruthers, who is a previous a past Chief Executive of the NHS. And that will have a series of I think quite far-reaching proposals in it. 
But it also seems to me that if you want to create massive change in any big system, people outside the system can comment, the newspapers will comment, others will comment, but it's only people in the system that can change it. And the best people to change it are those who deliver the service in healthcare systems. So anything that we do needs to make sense to them. And the sorts of things that make sense to people who are delivering services are either if your proposal improves their life, makes their life easier, or secondly, improves the quality of care that they can offer their patients. And you're a real winner if you can do both. So if we want sustainable change, if we want greater uptake of innovation, and if we want to start changing the service to make it more affordable, that leadership must come from the profession. And I believe that the professionals in the health service have got a moral, professional, and societal duty to do that, because otherwise there's a big opportunity cost for those who would otherwise get good treatment, who might not get as good treatment or might not get it at all. And given that Fiona's in the audience, one thing that I would ask is that journals consider what role they have in reminding people of the sorts of high quality evidence that they produce on a regular basis around the world, but then somehow or other goes forgotten. And do journals have a role in professional leadership and encouragement for reminding people of, of a given direction of travel over the years? So one of the, um, one of the, the big changes which we've done in the NHS recently has been around venous thromboembolism. There was good evidence that was presented that about 38,000 people a year in our NHS, which admits 14.5 million people a year into hospitals, about 38,000 of them suffer some kind of, of venous thromboembolism or deep vein thrombosis. And researchers told us and have been telling us over the years that 25,000 of those people died unavoidably. And I'd kind of listened to that evidence and I got asked to go to a, an all-party parliamentary group on, on thromboembolism. And I went and the chief medical officer was there presenting some stuff and there were others presenting the evidence supporting the magnitude of this particular problem. And when it came to the end, um, the president of the Royal College of Surgeons, John Black, stood up and he said, I did my thesis on this 30 years ago. He said, nothing has changed in 30 years. We've known about this. And he pointed at me and he said, why don't you mandate venous thromboembolism prophylaxis in the NHS? And then the president of the Royal College of Physicians stood up and said exactly the same. And I gave a kind of wishy-washy answer about how in a devolved healthcare system you don't tell people what to do. That you rely on clinical leadership and people doing the right thing. But as I walked back to my office, I was disturbed by the nature of the conversation we had had. I found myself asking, how have we got to a position where the leaders of the profession feel that they're in a system which has got so much inertia that they can't get the sort of good practice taken up that they know should be. And that worried me. So with the, uh, the regional medical directors, 10 regional medical directors of the country, we met with the presidents of the Royal College of different Royal Colleges, and we found common cause. And I think we hit upon something that was an effective mode of change. And that was that the Royal Colleges and Specialist Associations who have a, a, a significant level of identity with the workforce in, this, uh, in our health system would communicate with those working in the system that we were embarking on an endeavor to ensure that patients admitted to the NHS would be assessed for the risk of venous thromboembolism on admission and that they would then receive whatever that assessment uh, demanded. The deal, on the other hand, was that I would go back and put financial levers into the system and other incentives to make sure that happened, which we did. And in July last year, we think somewhere between 
25 and 30 percent of patients who were admitted to NHS hospitals were assessed for their risk of venous thromboembolism. July this year, it was 85 percent and rising. And that was because we were able to bring good, effective clinical leadership and combine it with, um, with effective government policy. Now, I believe that will have not only improved the quality of care in the NHS, but it will also have saved, ultimately, a substantial amount of money. I think that formula of good clinical leadership through clinical organizations, working closely with those who administer the healthcare services, is a good one that I'll be looking to, to exploit. But in any event, times are hard at the moment, and the economic reality of this has catalyzed reaction around the world. People are thinking about how to make their healthcare systems more affordable. But I put it to you that the opportunity has never been greater for clinicians and healthcare managers to change the paradigm of, of healthcare delivery and shape the future of, of health services in their respective countries. Thanks very much. I'm a humble GP in North London. I just want to find, just get a bit of an opinion from you. Practicing evidence-based medicine is expensive. On one hand, we do want to practice it. On the other hand, lots of cuts we have to make. Has, med has the medical law changed along with all these new changes we're doing? I'm sorry, I don't understand what you mean by medical law. Medicine. I mean, um, we worry oh, about litigation role. all yeah. the time. And most of the time, uh, a lot of GPs will make unnecessary referrals because of litigation. I, I'm just, I just wanted to find out, are there any thoughts about changing the law as well as, as we go along as well with the system? No, I haven't given that any thought. I'm interested, though, in your comment about evidence-based medicine costs more. Quite often costs more up front, but it saves a lot downstream. Because what is clear is that on the whole, for most things, that better care delivered the first time round saves money in the longer term. Hello, I'm Penelope Jarrett. I'm a GP. I'm also an ex-scientist. As an ex-scientist, I think you're perhaps conflating technology in general with information technology. They are quite different and the costs mm -hmm. are very different as well. As a GP, um, I know what the quality or lack of quality of patient records is in general practice and the best record is the one that's in my head not the one that's on the computer which is actually really quite difficult to get information from and I still find it quicker to say to the patient what are you allergic to rather than looking it up on the computer and it has always puzzled me why there was this big emphasis on the summary care record the spine and getting patient care records computerized it seems to me, as a, as a practicing clinician, that it'd be much, much more useful to put all that effort into getting good population-level data and data on our prescribing and such like. And I wonder what the evidence is for having a clinical summary record and how that would save anybody any money. First of all, if, if, if I've given the impression of conflating IT and other technology, I'm sorry about that because I'm quite clear in my own mind of the, the difference between the two, but I think the big driver is going to be IT. And there are some aspects of IT which will come at us that we don't expect. Do you remember when, when the iPad came out, the big debate in the newspapers was, what use is this? And it's been similar for many other IT, um, IT initiatives, so we must expect stuff to come out of the blind side. In terms of the summary care record, um, the evidence for the summary care record really comes from Scotland where it's had huge uptake. And, um, and that has been because it enables people running out of hours services or people in A&E to get access to the very basic information that's, uh, uh, that's available to enable them not to make serious errors which will put patient safety at risk. And for those of you that aren't familiar, the summary care record is, um, is a centrally held record which simply holds um, a patient identifier, what drugs they're on, and what allergy they have. And the idea of that is that if you uh, fall ill in Cornwall when you live in Birmingham, that somebody can log on 
and they can find out what your medications are, and, uh, uh, and from that they can work out generally what conditions you may have, and by knowing what allergies you've got, they don't do anything uh, that puts your life at risk. So that's, that's where the summary care record comes from. In terms of GPs carrying stuff in their head, I mean, that, that is the great strength of our primary care system. So when the NHS was set up in 1948, keeping primary care as the gatekeeper and the front door and the, the, the backbone of the NHS was, in my view, the strength of our healthcare system. And, and the wisdom of that decision has been borne out in a number of analyses. But to think, quite frankly, that that's the way of the future, I think is to absolutely deny the role that technology will play. And one of the things that I was putting to you is that as patients start to use information more and more, they will also carry this and they will also store it in other places. And therein, I think the primary care community are gonna to have to start thinking about how they deal with that. How, what happens if we get to a situation where a large proportion of the population store their healthcare information about themselves in a cloud somewhere and grant access permissions to people to use it. And what happens if that becomes the de facto place for the, for the continuity of care? That changes the relationship between patients and healthcare professionals irreversibly. And what I'm proposing, I'm just inviting you to think about whether that's a possibility. I think it's a probability in time. Um, and I, I understand the undertones of the, of the question about massive IT projects, and therein lies a, a, another reason why patients may want to take control of this. One more question down here, and then we'll take Hi, one My more. name is uh, Richard Feynman. I'm a retired physician, although still doing a little bit. I'm just worried about you saying uh, that you need financial levers to get me to write my patients up for subcutaneous heparin when they come into hospital. Because although I, I agree with you, and I agree with the colleges of physicians and the colleges of surgeons, it's been recommended for a long time and we should have been doing it. The only reason we are doing it is because you're putting the financial levers in and we have a lot of people in my hospital who are checking to see whether I'm doing that. We can't do it for every big change that we want. No, you're, you're quite right. Well, firstly, the evidence that the financial levers work is there for all to see. I've already quoted it. The second thing is those, those financial levers are not there just to force the clinicians. And believe me, there were many clinicians that did need forcing. It was there to get the whole organization to focus on it. So for many organizations, the sort of financial incentive we put into the system um, equated to, to up to and beyond a million pounds. So it wasn't a trivial amount of money. But what that did was it got everybody working in the organization, focusing on it, so supporting the clinical endeavor and making it easier. But you're absolutely right. You know, we can't do this for everything. I'm of the view that we need to, uh, that we really need to prioritize what we focus on in the NHS. Um, and it was clear that this was one area where there was a strong moral argument, there was a strong financial argument, um, and there was a strong argument for preventing, apparently, 25,000 deaths a year. And to put that in context, we are only about 30,000 people a year die from stroke. So we're talking about 25,000 avoidable deaths um, from this endeavor. So we also have, as part of work which has been conducted in the past by the National Quality Board, a set of rules which we will use for prioritizing, which look at the, the burden of disease, both um, in terms of mortality, morbidity, economics, the magnitude of the problem, um, in the population at large. It's amenability to improvement through, um, uh, through conventional policy levers. And I believe that that's, and, and, and where we stand in relation to other countries uh, in terms of a particular problem. So I believe we need to start taking that kind of hardcore evidenced approach to change, not simply responding to change because there's been a parliamentary question or somebody's spoken to somebody else in the corridors of power.
Can I just check that we've had the quality outcome framework in primary care, and it, it may suggest your anticoagulation is the first quality outcome framework you've applied in secondary care, and that there may be an argument to extend quality outcomes, which the audience says you pay for performance, and you are, hospitals are being paid for their anticoagulation, that you may extend that in secondary care, that model? <coughs> It's very different to the quality and outcomes framework mm. in primary care, which is a, is a kind of pay for performance system um, with positive incentives. The secondary care system historically has been mainly responsive to negative financial levers. So this was driven through a thing called the uh, uh, sequent commissioning for quality and innovation, which is a system whereby you pay um, a, certain, a certain amount for the delivery of something and you pay the full amount when uh, a mutually agreed quality target has been met. It's a bit like, and I, I hesitate to use this analogy, but in the construction industry, you, you never pay the full cost of the building for a year until you're sure that things haven't worked. So this is about people get the full cost if they, if they meet um, uh, certain quality criteria. And this is already going on at a number of different levels. This just happened to be a, one of the national sequin goals that we had. There are numerous regional ones and numerous uh, local ones. My, my name is Ted Rosenberg. I'm from Victoria, Canada, British Columbia. And um, you, you skipped over the demographics. And I, I do primary care geriatrics in the home for elderly people, for elderly people. And, um, you know, I think if we step back and look at it, the, you know, at least in North America, 50% of spending is over the age of 65, 20 to 30% is the last year of life, and half of that is in the last two months of life. And we need to step back and look at our expectations, you know, like you were alluding to in your talk. Uh, you know, when I look at my patients, most of them would prefer to die at home rather than to die in a nursing home or to die in a hospital, a acute care hospital. And by just rearranging the delivery of the system from a clinic to someone's home and you know, re changing the focus to it all starts there, uh, it, uh, we've been able to find that we could reduce acute care utilization by 40 to 60 percent, mm. and we could double the percentage of people dying in their own beds. Right, so I think we've got quite a lot to learn from Canada. We are in discussion with your administration, so I'm aware of that work. And people dying in... Um, in hospitals is a big issue here. 70% of our population want to die at home, 70% die in hospitals. So we've got a stream of work to try and reverse that as well.